these words of praise we want you to know the sincerity of our hearts that you God are truly holy that you're almighty that you alone deserve our praise God I pray that we will continue to recognize your power and your presence that we would indeed be overwhelmed by your glory that we would welcome the presence of your Spirit into our lives, not only now, but throughout the week. That as we encounter life as we know it, that we would know that we do not do life alone, but that you are right here with us. God, we thank you as believers that we have Christ within us, the hope of glory. And God, I pray for those who do not yet know you, Christ as Lord. I pray that even today they would receive you. Now, God, that they would know what it is to be filled with the joy that only comes from you. God, I pray that we would continue to be in your presence as you are in ours. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. And please be seated. It's a wonderful time to celebrate the glory of God this morning. I want to remind you about a word from the Gospel of John. And in John chapter 3, we are told that God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, this God who gave his only son is setting the example of generosity. Christ comes to us, as we've noticed in Matthew 11, and, and he asks us if we're tired and we're weary, and the answer obviously to that is yes. And many times in our life, we're tired, we're weary, some of you are burned out of religion, that phrase meaning that we're just not wanting to do the church thing in the sense of just the habits of church, but we really want to know what it is to, to be in relationship with Christ. And he invites us in Matthew 11, he says, I want you to walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it, Jesus says and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And we find that Jesus, just as the Father, did something over and over and over through his lifely journey, his life on earth in three years, and that was he gave, he gave, he gave, he gave. You and I, as followers of, of, the, of God through his Son and through the presence of the Spirit, are, are to be people who express what God did and what Jesus did, and that is to express generosity. And we do this in many ways. We do this in many ways. We do this when we open our ears uh, to those who need to listen, need to be heard. Uh, we do this when we see people who are in need of clothing and are and hungry and we provide needs for them. Uh, we do this when we see children who just need to be told, you are loved. Uh, we do this when we see a place to volunteer within the church and within the community, and we say, I can fill that spot. Uh, I can first serve where I'm gifted, and then second, I can serve where I'm needed for short term because I know no one else is stepping up, and, and so we can be a part of that. And we can also be wise in our use of money, to be, be generous with our money, and by this we understand that God is calling us to do an amazing thing. Now, in that latter example of how we are to use money to glorify God, I want you to notice that Jesus spends a lot of time in Scripture talking about our use of money. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus, we might say, hammers this subject. And I believe he hammers this subject because it is such an issue with which many of us struggle. Either we don't have a good concept of money and how to handle it, or we become consumed by the possession of it, or we are foolish with it. There are many ways that we can misuse money. And so Jesus talks about this, and he continues to proclaim it, and he, he talks a lot about money. Some people say, don't talk about money. Well, if you don't talk about money, you don't talk about what Jesus talked about. And, and so Jesus understood that we needed to understand how to handle these finances. So I want us to look at some verses uh, where we are to be invited in to the word of Jesus 
in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 10, this, this comes at the end of a parable. Jesus often talked about money in the form of parable, uh, maybe to take the sting out, I'm not sure. Uh, but at the end of the shrewd manager story, he goes on and says this. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot do it. When we look at these words, we understand that what God does is he entrusts the trustworthy. Now that if you have a good track record in finances, God will bless you in that. If you have a track record of being stingy, if you have a track record of not handling it wisely, Scripture tells us that God is not going to bless that. I want us to look at Luke chapter 12. We find this. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. Uh, there, there are some words that I find very helpful on this subject. And they come from a man over 250 years ago, uh, John Wesley. Some of you know the name John Wesley. Uh, he and his brothers are the founders of Methodism as we know it. Uh, it's altered over the years, obviously. But, but John and Charles uh, were two brothers who, when they were in the Ivy League colleges, uh, they began to see that there was a faith that was degrading among their peers. And they found out that what was going on, at least in their lives and others, was people didn't have what was known as spiritual disciplines, we would call them. And so they came up with methods, methods, thus Methodism. They came up with methods or practices to help people grow in their faith. And Charles went on to be one of the greatest composers of, of hymns and music, and many of you sung his words, and, and John, the main teacher. He traveled on horses around the lower 48 and ponies and preached the gospel and, and spread the word of Jesus, and we're thankful for that. Well, well he, he tried to teach this idea of the use of money. In fact, he entitled a message, The Use of Money, and I'm going to share clips of it this morning, if you will, uh, auditorily, not visually, of course. We don't have it on video, uh, but I want to share John's words on the idea of use of money. He says this. He says, wealth has been regarded by poets and philosophers as a source of evil, and yet the fault lies not with the money, but with those who use it. Indeed, money should be regarded as a gift of God for the benefits that it brings in ordering the affairs of civilization and the opportunities it offers for doing good. In the hands of God's children, money is food for the hungry, clothing for the naked, and shelter for the str stranger. With money, we can care for the widow and the fatherless, defend the oppressed, meet the need of those who are sick or in pain. It is therefore most urgent that God's people know how to make use of their money for his glory. All the necessary instructions can be condensed into three simple rules. Gain all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. Gain all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. Uh, Jackson was kind enough to share his bank with me. It's, uh, it's empty right now, just in case you're wondering. And there is a lesson here. It's what Wesley talked about. Uh, that when we were wise with our money, and Josh and Christina are trying to teach her children at a young age, as I hope you've been taught at a young age, if not, it's not too late to learn, uh, that God has called us to, to manage our finances well. And one of the ways we can do that is to know that we can, we can spend, which is what we gain, and we can give, which is our tithe and offerings, and we can save. And I want to encourage you to do that. So, uh, kids, I want you to come on up here for just a second. Come on up, kids. I actually mean that. Come on up. Sometimes I say things your parents don't know whether to respond or not. So I'm, I'm actually saying, come on up. Come on up. Now, what animal is that? That's a pig, right? Who, raise your hand if you've heard of a piggy bank. Uh, who has a piggy bank? All right. Maybe you want to get one. And then, and then the globe. That's the earth. 
And that's to help people around the earth. And then this is a, supposed to be a coin to spend for a bit of fun. So pass that basket this way. Let's start down here and just pass it down. Somebody open those up and tell me what's in them. There's money. Anybody know what kind of money? Dimes. Can you count them for me? Not a hundred dimes, but <laughs> ten dimes. Like, wow, we really stacked your envelope, buddy. <laughs> All right, you go back to your seats now. Uh, there are ten dimes in there. I want you to hold on to those, show them to your parents, and we're going to do something more with them here in just a little bit. There's a reason... Uh, we, we handed out those dimes, and, and you know why. And adults, if you really want a packet of dimes, come see me later, and we'll give them to you. No catch. All yours. Except for something we're going to get to here in just a minute. But I want to I go through these ideas of to, to gain all you can, to save all you can, and to give all you can. Uh, now, some of you might have thought when you, you heard me talking about money that I was going to focus only on the latter. But when we do focus on the latter, we miss the whole. We miss the whole. Because what Wesley was on to, he didn't just come up on his own. Jesus talks about this. Jesus talks about money management. Jesus talks about how to handle the blessings God has given us. And one of the things that, that I try to do on a regular basis out loud for myself and my family is to recognize God's provision. Let me give you an example. Um, it's been awfully cold, right? Everybody agree with that? Um, almost on a daily basis during dinner prayer or, or nightly prayer, whichever it is, I'll say out loud for my reminder and for our kids, God, thank you for a heated home. God, thank you for a heated home. Um, I'll also say this, about a week ago, uh, our dryer uh, sounded like a monster was in it and bouncing across the laundry room. You ever had one of those dryers? It's just like, it's done. And, and I had to go buy a dryer. Now, dryers aren't cheap, relatively, and so we went and bought a dryer. What did I do that evening at dinner? God, thank you that we could go buy a dryer. I didn't have to hesitate. I didn't think about it. I put the old one in the back of the truck. Later took it to the, the resource center, whatever you do, recycle. And I took the other one. We put it in our laundry room, and within hours, a few minutes actually, it was hooked up, and we dried clothes. You need to realize, as you think about what you have, and, and all of us in here have some to a degree, some less, some more, but all of us, if you bothered to take the time, ate something this morning. Looks like everybody in here is wearing clothes, thankfully. Uh, we have heat on. Uh, you, most of you drove. Some of you drove two cars. Um, it's a time where we say, thank you, God, for what you have given us. And we never need to be ashamed of that because the Scripture says we need, in the words of Wesley, we need to gain all we can, we need to save all we can, and we need to give all we can. So let's think about this idea of gaining. I want us to look over at 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 10, and then we'll uh, flip over a little bit to another passage later. In 2 Thessalonians chapter, two, verse t uh, chapter 3, verse 10, it says this, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now what he's getting at there, Paul is, is he's telling people that there is a responsibility on every individual who is physically and mentally able, we would add, a to earn to gain all that you can. It is a responsibility given to us, able-bodied, able-mind, that we are to earn or to gain all that we can. That is what is presented before us. Now, what's happened here in Thessalonica, as Paul's addressing, is, is there are some people who are so heavenly-minded, as we'd say, they're no earthly good, as the old phrase goes. 
Uh, in other words, they're so occupied with the coming of Christ, they've decided to sit back and say, well, I'm just going to wait till Jesus comes again. So some of them have stopped working. Some of them have stopped earning their keep, as we might say. And Paul says, whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, Christ is coming soon. But he's not here yet. And, and so don't rely on other people exclusively. You need to gain. You need to earn. You need to work. Those who do not work shall not eat, he says. It may sound harsh, but it's reality of life. When people are able-bodied and able-minded, they need to go out and earn or to gain, as Wesley would say. Uh, what we would say if we use this analogy and this image of uh, Jackson's Bank uh, Percentage-wise, what we're talking about here, and we'll get to this, uh, but the spending money or this gaining uh, is 80, 80 uh, percent. Biblically, uh, we know there's a 10 percent we're going to talk about, but a good rule of thumb is 80 percent. What does that look like? You look at your salary for a year, you look at your weekly paycheck, however once you want to check it, and you say, I am going to live off 80 percent. I'm going to live off 80%. If you're living off 100%, in other words, you're keeping 100% of what you earn by, for yourself, you're not using it wisely. Uh, you, you need, I would say, 80% of what you earn needs to be spent. You can buy your food, buy your dishwashers, buy your washing machines, buy your, uh, buy your trip to Hawaii, and buy your vehicle when you need to buy a vehicle, uh, buy your spouse a nice gift. And these are the things we do with that 80%. But there's more. We also need to save. We also need to save. Save is something that's so important because if we don't save for that inevitable rainy day, we are going to be caught off guard. We are going to be caught off guard. And you read Proverbs, and it is full of emphasis on the idea of saving. Now, one of the things that Proverbs talks a lot about is the idea of being foolish. And I want us to look at Proverbs chapter 21. It says verse, in verse 20, The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp there's down but fools gulp gulp there's down uh, are you foolish or are you wise with what god has given you are you foolish or are you wise with what god has given you i was talking to one of our members right before the service and he was telling me uh, about a person who recently received an inheritance a, a big a big inheritance and unfortunately this this person was foolish with it because within a matter of months it was gone have you ever been there? Ever done that? Maybe you learned early as a child uh, that money was burning a hole in our pocket, as you might say, and you went and spent it. And then next thing you know, you really wanted something else, but you wasted it on 16 packs of bubble gum. Well, think, think about that, adults. It's not 16 packs of bubble gum anymore. Another man I talked to this morning, it isn't convenient to have all these conversations. They had no idea what I was going to talk about this morning. I had a conversation this morning uh, with a friend, and uh, he, uh, he told me that he I bought, so he showed me this item he had. And I said, where'd you get that? And he said, Amazon. And he said, I need to shut down my Amazon account. And I said, why do you need to shut down your Amazon account? And he says, well, he says, I, I see it, never knew it, but I knew I think I need it. And so anything he sees on Amazon, he doesn't need, he buys it anyway. He says, I need to shut down my Amazon account. He understands that if he is going to be wise with his money, he needs not put the things in front of him. Now, some of you don't need to do that drastic of a measure, but some of you do. You can't handle money. And the Bible calls you foolish. Not because you're a fool. Uh, not because you don't have the intelligence, but because you're practicing foolish activity. So if you are spending more than you make, that is foolish. If you are not saving, that is foolish. And so Wesley is trying to talk to people and say, here's what you need to do. Quoting Jesus, quoting the Proverbs, quoting Paul. You need to gain, but you also need to save. So rough numbers here, and it may vary. Uh, but I recommend at least 10%. So if you're living off 80, you save 10. You save 10. Save 10% of what you make. And when you're able to save more, go for it. But I underst understand me that if you start early, and kids pay attention to this, if you start early and you begin to save and save and save, there will come a day when you're going to need that. But you don't need it right now. So when unexpected things come up, such as dry dryers and vehicles that break down, and medical bills come up, you are able to meet those needs. This won't always be the case. That's when we need help from others. But the majority of the time, you will be prepared for life if you will take 
what you have, and you live off less than you make, and you save. Make sure you save. Now, here's what I want to pick up with Wesley again. He says something very important. Because remember, he said, gain all you can and save all you can, but he said one more. Wesley says this. But let not any man imagine that he has done anything barely by going thus far, by gaining and saving all he can. If he were to stop there, all this is nothing. If a man go not forward, if he does not point all this at a further end, add the third rule to the two preceding. Having first gained all you can, and secondly saved all you can, then give all you can. Give all you can. Some of you know the wonderful feeling that comes from giving. You know that. Some of you have been overwhelmed with the amazing opportunity God has given you to to give. Give. Uh, Tyler, Texas, we lived there for three years in between Alaska pastorates. And uh, just a couple months after we got there, we were in a devastating car accident. It scared us to death, but we did not die, obviously. And uh, we, we were in a situation where we didn't have a vehicle uh, that we needed. And it was financially tight. And what were we going to do? And uh, so this retired physician uh, invites me over to his home. And he says, Mark, come to my garage. And so I go into his garage, and he, he shows me a 1984 Crown Vic. Anybody remember what these things are? Little cop cars, right? So I keep in mind, this is about 2005. And, and he, he says, I want to give you a car. And I said, thank you. And for three years, we drove a Crown Victoria. Am I lying? No. My kids love the car. It was a blessing to him to give me a 1984 Crown Vic. To him, it was a wonderful, beautiful car. Uh, Texas actually needed heaters every once in a while, but the heater didn't work, so we threw blankets on our kids whenever it did get cold enough. Uh, the radio didn't work, but it was a vehicle. It was a vehicle. Three years later, praise be to God, I was called to Rabbit Creek Church, which means we could get rid of the Crown Vic. And uh, there was a man that was working at a church where a friend of mine was pastor. And Mark, it's another pastor's name. Mark and I were talking, and he said, you're moving, right? I said, yes. He said, what are you doing with that car? I said, well, uh, if I just give it to somebody in need. He said, he said, there's a man in my church who is desperately in need of a vehicle. And so he took the keys and handed them to Mark, who in turn handed them to his church member. And the man, as I heard, never met him personally, uh, was filled with joy. You see how that happened? Someone said, I see a man in need, a family in need. Here's a car. I did not look a gift horse in the mouth, and we took the crown Vic. And then in turn, three years later, we're able to give to someone else. The joy that filled our heart. And, and we have given away two vehicles and been able to say to people, here you go. There's joy in that. Some of you know that. And some of you have given the things a lot more valuable than the Crown Vic. Uh, because you know what it is to be able to bless someone else. And this is what he is saying here, is give all you can. Now what is Jesus talking about that Wesley's referring to? Jesus is talking about generosity. This Jesus who gave his life is instructing us to be generous people. And I want you to hear some words from Paul who followed in line with Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, we hear uh, these wonderful words. He says, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love we have kindled in you, we see, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Paul is saying to them, you're doing a lot right. Corinthian Christians, you are doing a lot right. You are, you are listening to the words of God as they're preached. You, you are serving the community. You are loving people. Make sure that just as you excel in that, excel in this as well. Why is it so important? Well, he goes on to tell them in the next chapter. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we hear these words. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I can't think of a better reason to be generous than for God to receive thanksgiving. Verse 12, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The Bible says something very interesting about giving. And sometimes we just get hung up on parts of it. But I want, to, I want to share with you a rule of thumb from which to start. Uh, remember that 80% that you're gaining and, and living off of and enjoying vacations and food and other things with. And then remember that 10% where you are, you are saving because you never know what tomorrow brings. Fools gulp things down. Wise people save. And then the Bible talks about this thing called a tithe. Uh, the tithe is that next 10%. Um, it, it's a word that is saying, here is a way to give back the 100% God has given me. I'm going to attribute, to recognize he's given me the 100%. I'm going to give 10 back. That it's his to begin with, and so I'm just giving it back to recognize it's all his. It all belongs to him. I just give back some of it. And then Paul will take it a, a different, different way because some people get caught up in legalism of the tithe. Uh, the only time tithe is mentioned in the New Testament is when Jesus is telling people not to forsake it. They're doing it, but they're not being gracious and merciful. So he says, continue to this and do this. So we believe the tithe is still in action. Uh, but some people would argue that, and you, you see a lot of churches arguing about it. But the argument's over when Paul says, give as you've decided in your heart, based upon, as we see, God's generosity. And so as my pastor said, if under law the tithe was 10%, how much more should it be under grace? And so really, we're getting a deal with the tithe, wouldn't you say? When God gives us all, and we give back to him. Uh, one of the things that we can do, some of you have been blessed exceedingly abundantly because you've worked hard, and you've been able to be able to see the, the wealth that God has given you. And I believe when you're in situations like this, you say, I've got this 80, 10, 10 thing down, but you know what? Maybe I need to drop that to 75 so I can give more. There are people who give exceedingly and abundantly more, and it all pours out to Thanksgiving. So no matter where you are, where you started, or you're saying, I've got this down, I need to continue my generosity, uh, you need to understand what that is. So this is where the dimes come in handy. So kiddos, open those envelopes, pour out your dimes. Uh, there should be 10 in there, right? We're going to do a little math. 80% of 10 dimes. Anybody know if you need to cheat, ask your parents. 80 cents. What are you going to do with that 80 cents? Whatever you want. 80 cents. As long as it's God honoring, 80 cents. That leaves how many cents? 20 cents. What are you going to do with one of those 10? Hint, piggy bank. What are you going to do with it? Tithe. All right. And the other one you're going to do what with? Save it. So parents, you need to learn the same thing. Uh, kiddos are going to teach us. So kids, stand up. Now, there are baskets in the back. It's up to you. We can't make you do this. But just as God has given us everything he asked for back, we've given you all this. We want some back. Go put a dime in the baskets in the back. Every kid that wants to, you feel in your heart, it's a good thing to do. Put a dime, just a dime, in the basket. You keep the other nine. You keep the other nine. You keep 90 cents and give back to God 10. And here's what you're going to do with those 90 cents. You're going to go home and you're going to give one 
dime to your piggy bank or to your mom or your dad and say, save this for later. And then you got 80 cents. I know I won't buy much, but after all, it's just a lesson. Parents, I promise you, we're not going to hand out money to you to practice this on you. Uh, but I do encourage you uh, to see that just as God has given us everything that we need to give back. So maybe you're really good at giving but not good at saving. Learn to save. Maybe you're good at saving but not giving. Learn to give. Or maybe you don't save our gift because you're just overwhelmed because you spent way more than you earned. Start over. Quit being a fool and doing foolish things. Trust God. Gain all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. God, I pray that you'd help us to be wise with what you've given us. God, I pray that you will help us to be able body, to be able mind, so that we can gain all we can. And out of that gain, God, we, we know that we need to save because we do not know what tomorrow brings. And, and we are able to, to not worry about tomorrow as you've instructed us when we're prepared for it. And God, help us to be generous. Help us to give. Help us to, to give faithfully and joyfully. And thank you for the opportunity to do so. We pray, pray all this in the powerful and loving name of Jesus Christ who gave his all for us. Amen.